Okay. So as we were sort of getting ready here, I was sort of lamenting how it's there's so many things that I want to talk about. I want us to talk about. I want us to be talking about, and it's hard to um, uh, cover them all. They just don't, you know, time is linear, and this stuff we want to talk about is not really linear. Um, or maybe time is linear, but. Um, uh, well, so uh, last time I was really talking about, uh, if, if I can remember what I was talking about, I was talking a lot about uh, my attempts to intuitively understand the art and reciprocity theorem, stuff like that. And um, I, I, was use, I was doing a lot of Gaussian integer examples. And um, I, so in the past week, I've been doing a lot of... Uh, concrete experimentation with the Gaussian integers in like Mathematica. Uh, and it's going very interesting, but I don't have it, <clears throat> I don't have it to the point where I can, you know, tell you anything interesting about it yet. So I'm, I'm not actually gonna be talking about that this week, but I'm, I'm gonna be talking about some things that are perhaps very related to it. And, and also perhaps talking about things that are sort of a follow-up to what you were talking about last week, if I can remember what it was, which I think you're talking about this uh, concept of separable. Well, <laughs> right. This, this, so it, it, it's this word separable, uh, but it, it's a terminology that works in a funny way because it's like yep. the generalization of a classical terminology. So I was going to say like it's a separable commuter of ring or something like that, but I'm not even sure that's the right context in which to give this word separable. It's 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 best most general meaning um people would say separable algebra over some other commutative algebra that's a pretty good context yeah Sorry, but, I, but, I have, but i have a feeling like, but, over some that, ring. but but i have a feeling you but you were really making it sound like they were doing something more general than that i thought but or, or you know that they were using oh it know, gets more thinking of these apps you know algebra objects or ring yeah objects. that's true yep they're these neo classical generalizations uh-huh so um so, so and, and and so you were talking about that and you were talking about how it relates to Bruton Deke's ideas about Galois theory or something like that mm -hmm. and um I I didn't um, completely absorb all of this yet um and it, I didn't completely absorb, absorb absorb it all yet and I'm really mulling over in my mind how it relates to the ways I've been thinking about Galois theory and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and so um so yeah so I may be saying something about that today and um uh right <laughs> i mean what am i trying to say that one of the things i've been mulling over is like why is it that i that i'm not sure but so far so far i haven't noticed having a need for this concept of separability in the work that i've been doing and um and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it, maybe I do have a need for it. And I just haven't noticed it, or um, maybe I'm using some one other concept to sneak around and uh, get so one thing is that like yeah. all extensions of fields of characteristic zero are separable. So uh, it's an elusive concept if you're focused on number fields and it's also true that all extensions of finite fields are separable so <laughs> well, well, okay 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 but but that's not only what, what i've been thinking about I, I, uh, i've been thinking okay, a lot about good. commuter rings and number okay. rings uh -huh. okay um, oh, yeah. and um mm -hmm. uh you know like rings of algebraic integers and things like that um, oh uh, yeah i mm. 
I don't know, but I bet that those were all severable, but I don't know. Yeah. Ah. Uh, I don't know, but I should find out. Well, but but I've also been thinking about uh, <laughs> more general range, uh, yeah. more general commuter range. Um, and uh, I'm st I'm still not sure I've run into any need for this yet. And oh, but also I'm I'm also I mean you know I'm not very good with standard terminology. So like uh, we very briefly mentioned last time uh, wondering what's the relationship between things like separable and things like a tal and things like that. Mm -hmm. And not that I understand the meaning of either of those all that precisely yet, but um, but aside from that, wondering about the relationships between them. Um, so, um, so yeah, so okay, I do have an example to, to ask you about in a moment that we were that's related to what this issue of the rings of rings of algebraic integers, but also related things. Um about whether separability might show up there. All right, all right. We'll see. I start. There's a lot of things I'm confused about here. But um, so. Uh, Right. Well, so 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 one of the, when I'm wondering to what extent I'm really going to need this concept of separability, I sometimes wonder to myself, how does it relate to this concept of torture that I've been thinking about a lot? Um, mm -hmm. And and I've been wondering whether this concept of torture that I've been thinking about, whether it some again is somehow allowing me to like sneak around a need for talking about separability maybe maybe i'm not actually sneaking successfully sneaking around any barriers there but um but i but i'm wondering about it and um so like i say there are so many things that i want to talk about and it's impossible to talk about all of them but w one of them that i brought up a while ago and then I, I, I later fixed out, figured out some ways to fix some problems with it to improve the situation, but I didn't really, I, I, I didn't have a place in the discussion to talk about it until now. But I think it, I think it sort of makes sense to, to, to talk about this in the discussion right now. And so, so it, we're revisiting this idea of what a torsor is, and, um, and. Uh, Um, so in, so in, 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 you know, I have, to, I have to think a little bit about the generality in which I want to talk about tortures here. Um, so let's say, uh, let's see, have I got the right color here? Here's my cursor black. Okay. Um, so, uh, Well, we have this idea of total two rigs. Mm -hmm. And I, I sometimes vacillate about the exact definition of it, but it's some kind of very nice two rig, um, you know, in some sort of adjoint functor theorem paradise. Um, and, uh, and, Well, so so I guess the first question is, do we have the theory of a group object G together with a G torsor T? Um, G 
do we have that concept making sense in this doctrine? You, you know, so, okay. So okay. A specific, sorry, a specific, did you say a group object, a general group? Not a specific group, but like a group. Well, <laughs> okay, okay. I have to think about this. I have to, I have to think about this. Um, the, the, I want to say the theory of a I call this the the, the theory of a uh, commutative half object. Okay, G So that's a general group one. <laughs> the people who are listening to me yeah yeah yes i mean right the letter d is chosen there because i want to think of this commutative half object as being basically a group in some sense mm -hmm. um together with uh a <laughs> so okay this is very sort of mixed language Right. Theory of a commutative, it's right. Commutative half object V, that's like sort of very algebraic language. And then suddenly I'm saying together with a G towards her T. Um, so that's very sloppy language because of the way it's. Yep. Different. Well, it's someday someone will define a towards her for a commutative hop algebra. And then this will make sense. Well, I uh, 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 I do mean something precise. Yeah, I, I think it's just the language that I'm being very. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I don't have a very good. I can't think. I just can't think of a offhand of a better way to say it. Um, so yeah, so so this is if this is supposed to. This is this theory is supposed to make sense in this doctrine, the doctrine of total two rates. Um, you know, so for example, we'd like to understand concretely as or as, as nicely as we can the um the syntactic category of this theory in this doctrine. Um, mm -hmm. and, um but that's not my main goal today. I mean but that's a sort of fun thing to try to work out. Um so let's see. So I have a feeling that this is, you know, we're using some sort of interpretation of doctrines here to get this theory. Because right, we could we, we right we could actually say. Uh, let, let me describe another theory, um, which lives in a slightly different doctrine, um, and and then we'll see how this. This theory that I'm describing now actually gives rise to the to 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 the other one by means of an interpretation of doctrines or something like that. So uh, we want to say the theory of a I just have right now I have to try to get the algebra versus geometry direction straight. So let me think. So what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about limit theories. Is that right? Uh, but but do I prefer to talk about limit theories or do, do I prefer to talk about co-limit theories? I think I prefer to talk about well, I, I guess I should use both of them. So let, let's say the the uh, let's say the smallly sketched limits theory. So I'm saying smallly sketch because that's kind of the doctrine that I want to stick to. Because okay, 
the, the doctrine of smallly sketched limits theory. This is sort of very nice to work with. It's basically the category of locally presentable categories or the opposite of that or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 the smallly sketched limits theory of, uh, well, <clears throat> Maybe I'll just erase smallly sketched and, and just, you know, say the limits theory. So for limits theory for now is supposed to mean that it is. Uh-huh. That's fine with me. No, I'm vacillating about that. I think I'm going to keep smallly sketched. <laughs> smallly sketched <laughs> limits theory of a group. Okay, so I need the thing here. Okay. The theory of a group object. G together with a G torsor T. Mm -hmm. When you when we last talked about this, yes, there was like some little niggly. That's right. Leftover issue about the empty. That's right, and I think I figured out. I think I figured out a couple of weeks ago. How to completely fix that problem? I okay. Think. But then the question is, how, like how well will I remember be able to remember today <laughs> how I thought I fixed it a couple of weeks ago? What did you say? Yeah. Anyway, I'd be interested in that, even though it's sort of a technical issue. It's I've, in a way, it's a technical issue. In a way, it's actually more than a better than a tech, tech more important. Uh, yeah, I guess issue. probably. Um, so a group object G together with a G tortured T. Right. Or and I, I guess you could say the Smalley sketched co limits theory. Yeah, you know, I'm just formally dualizing here. So it'd be a co group object, which I guess I'll still use the same letter together with a co G torsion. G co torsion. G co torsion. T. But okay, how do we so how do we how, how do we get from these concepts, which live, live in just the doctrine of pure limits or its dual doctrine of um, pure co-limits, how do we get from that to this um theory in the doctrine of uh little two rigs? Yeah, yeah. So how do we do that? Uh it would seem easier to me if you like used locally presentable in both for both of them. And then hopefully there's some kind of base change of locally presentable categories theorem that I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like there should exist. That you could no, but I think I'm, I, no, no, I think I might be doing, am I doing something stupid here. Let me think. Um you know, because a hot valve is, is going is to really involve not just the low limits or, or co limits, it's going to involve the tensor product of the, the two rig. Um, oh, right. So. Well, yeah. But. Uh, but, but isn't there like a. Like, yeah. a, like if your two rigs are like enriched over vector spaces over some particular field, for example, for that's sorry, that's that's also. Uh, question, but let's just suppose that then, then there's like a functor from set to vector spaces with tensor product that you could use I, to get like set, try to turn set enriched locally presentable categories into vect enriched locally okay yeah no let's see ah, yeah i'm not, really not sure this is right i mean yeah. uh that enriched I, i'm thinking maybe i need finite limits theories instead of smallly sketched limits theories uh, but i wasn't expecting this um <laughs> you know what let's okay this this is actually a separate issue we we, we can just go ahead and think about you know this one right here and um and in fact it would it would it would be okay to think of it as a finite limits theory um yeah and and then later on we can worry about you know 
how to reinterpret it back in this other doctrine. Okay. Yeah, I still think what I was saying almost made sense, but I should have. It, 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 it very well could be. I'm, I'm just. I just got so lost. I didn't say um, it quite right because I didn't yeah. stick the. So I'm hoping. I'll just say it for the record. Yeah. I'm yeah. hoping that like the functor from set to vector spaces over k lets you turn any <laughs> any symmetric monoidal set enriched locally presentable category. So I'm hoping that assemblage of adjectives works out right to a vect enriched symmetric monoidal locally presentable category. So I'm demanding in both cases some compatibility of the tensor product with the co-limits that, that that's implicit in the, that pile of adjectives. And I'm just hoping that that. I mean, this reminds me of the way works. that some people right def define a group to be define groups to be a Hopf algebra or something. They, they define a group to be a Hopf object, and you know, and and then they just say when you specialize that to over the category of sets, it actually specializes to the concept of group because, you know, automatically, the um, you know you don't even have to right. say that the that it's yeah. a commutative hop object it's just automatic you know the only hop right. objects there are in that particular context are the commutative hop objects right um yeah so yeah i i mean i i i'm making some very what well, well, i i i you know i'm 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 handling that part of the, of the issue very badly at the moment so i'm i'm not i'm going to try to not think about that yeah. at the moment okay i'm going to try to think of how to fix this concept right here in, in yeah, the in, in the limits doctrine fine that's okay good. and then yeah. uh all right so 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 okay so so what are we trying to say here so we have um okay so we so we're gonna have first of all a group object g okay Yep. Then we're going to have a um, an an object T that a, 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 a G action. We're going to have a G action T. Mm -hmm. And so that looks like T who thinks to. T or something like that. And then, you know, there's action associativity and so forth, but I'm not focusing on that at the moment. Um, okay. But a torsor is one of the things that makes a torsor special is that not only can you multiply by a group element, but you can divide by a group element. You meant you can divide by a torsor element? <laughs> is that what I said? Uh, yes, you're right. Okay. So, right, okay, it's the other way around. Uh, that's right, that's right, right. You can divide by a torsor element, okay. So let me think about what that means. Uh, okay, so I'll call this A, the action. And then we had some division or distance displacement operation D mm -hmm. okay and then we had this idea that you know that they that these fit together in a sort of relatively obvious way which says what that um something's an inverse of something that multiplying a group element by a torsor element, you know, I'm multiplying a variable group element by a constant torsor element. That is the thing that's supposed to be, is supposed to have an, an inverse. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 
Okay. And that is the, yeah, okay. So how do I say that? Um, I think before you said it in some sneakily efficient way where you puffed up that action A to a map from T times G to T times T. Right. Where the second T uh, just is like coming from the identity. And then you said that that map had an inverse. Okay. Okay. So let me have to write that down. T to G to T times T. And it's... um. What is it? It's a comma some projection or something? Yeah, or the projection. Which one should I put first? Uh, a. Uh, yeah, I don't know. P is this projection. Uh huh. Um, and you think that that has an inverse? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, right, right, right. You can say, right. The first element and the group element's gonna it's gonna act on uh, that's gonna act on it um gives you see I think I I think it should be the projection should come first. <laughs> that, that sounds right. Yeah, the first well, yeah. For me, conceptually it works better, but it could easily be different for people with different conventions. Yeah, but... Well, it's fine. It's yeah, well, yeah, no, I think that is right for given how you're given what you're doing. Oh, okay another convention so so that so then the inverse will also have projection being its first component of necessity i think and then so then the second component will be this thing you call d hopefully yeah i think that's really it i think that's right that's that looks right so the first now element just sort of sits okay. there so you have yeah you have like t1 and g1 and it goes to uh, T1, comma, T1 acted on by G1. And going backwards, you have T1, T2 is T1, uh, the, you know, the distance from. I would say T1 over T2, but yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, the division. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's for division or distance or displacement. Yeah. Um, You're missing a right parenthesis. It's making me very yes. nervous. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Since I'm a computer. Okay. And so that's the two sided inverse thing. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. But okay. So this is what we did. And it has this disadvantage, right? It's, 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 it's sort of wrong, evidently. This is not enough to give us what we want. Right. Because this allows the, um, the, it allows empty the empty, empty doors are a non-empty group to sneak in or something like that. Yeah. And of course, it's sort of funny because empty is a very co limity thing to say i mean not that you want to say it is empty but <laughs> empty is a co limity thing to say and this is all very limity this doctrine i don't know if that i don't know if that's important but yeah i'm, I'm eager to see how in the world you s sneak out of this while staying in the limits yeah I, I, unless i'm screwing up now then i think it's really ridiculously easy to fix the problem and i was you know, being silly for not figuring out how to fix it so okay. So let's see if we can figure out how to fix it. <laughs> it's supposed to be something up. I thought I had it a moment ago. Let me think. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think it just comes down to we want to say, you know, we want to be able to recover the group. Right. Let's just think in terms of that way. Hopefully, it's going to be obvious if we're testing in terms of, you know, being able to recover the group. Sounds good from to the me. Torsor. But how? Yeah. Um, well, okay, so I'm trying to say something like that we want to be able to recover the, remember, 
<laughs> is this going to work? Let's see. Uh, Yeah, I don't know how to, <laughs> I'll just say like, I don't know how to do it except by saying that your torsor has a, a point, but that's of course exactly what you, you don't want to say, you don't want to specify a point. Well, okay, right. Now I'm worried I'm making some horrible level step or something like that. But but no, what I want to say is, some, is something like this. I want to say something like that we're going to try to recover the group as the orbit space of the Horizer squared um, act on by by something. Like, what am I trying to say? Uh, you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna start to, to try to right. I, I, I am <laughs> I'm making some horrible level slip about the doctrines here or something like that, but. Um, is an uh, orbit. Uh -huh. Sorry, uh, isn't, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried I'm making a horrible level slip about this concept of orbit space. I mean, on the one hand, it's something that goes along with groups, but on the other hand, it's you know, it's like it's like a co-limit. Right. That's just and, what I was and, and that has to do with the doctrine that we're in. So am I making some mistake there? Let's let's see if we can get it to work. Okay. I, I want to say, I want to say that um uh that. Uh, okay, maybe, right now, now maybe right. This is the part where having the finite piece of paper is annoying. I have to go to a new page here. So, what have we got here? We've got t squared and we have g acting on t squared by um by what? I mean, so I've got, you know, I'm now thinking of my screen as T. Uh -huh. and, and unfortunately, it's not, the zoom, zoom screen is not infinite. <laughs> so, and it's not, it's, it's not looped either. Uh, right, but remember my other notebook really does have an infinite screen. So think it, pretend I'm using my other notebook, the one with okay. the graph paper background. Um, so. Uh, have you ever tested how infinite it is? uh i i haven't tested it very far can you zoom can you zoom well I, i've tested the zooming more than i've tested the translation translation or scrolling <laughs> whatever um, so you, I'm, very curious, I'm very curious about the zoom <laughs> you know yeah i mean you. have you reached the limit of the zoom have you like no i i haven't I, I haven't reached the limit of the zoom i haven't i haven't done that far i haven't gone that one Further, but that one seems to me trickier or something like that. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about how it's implemented. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, no. I, <laughs> see if you can crash the system by zooming by a factor of ten to the tenth. <clears throat> All right. So there's you know like A and B, and here's like C and D, but they're supposed to represent the same group element. So it's. Right. This is this is just right. We're, we're, you know, T is a group action. T is a G action. T is a G yep. object. No. Yep. And T squared, straightforwardly because I think, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, if you let act on each component, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm trying. To, I'm just trying to make sure that that actually parses in the doctrine, but I think it does. That does. It does. Yeah. So I'm just being. You know. <laughs> I'm waiting for. I'm trying to trap you. But okay. You should. Yeah, you should be trying to. But, trap I'm, but I'm not. Uh, I'm, but before you trap me, you kind of have to. Yeah, yeah this isn't going to be the place. <laughs> this, okay. Yeah, this is the part where you encourage me before you discourage. Yeah, me. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, Walk so, yeah. so, okay, and now I just want to take like some co-equalizer here. So you're gonna take co-equalizers now? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm gonna take some co-equalizer, or you know, it may be a sort of what do I call it? A sort of variable co-equalizer or something. You know what I mean? Uh, so what am I trying to say? That. Um, so even though it's a limits theory, you're what are you doing? You're you're like using the full power of local presentability to 
know that you get to do some, you get to talk about co-limits too. Is that, can you talk about co-limits? <laughs> All right, let me think, let me think. Okay, 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 right. Have, am I, okay, now I'm really, now, now I'm really confused. So this is what I mean. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, yeah, no, that's not what I was saying. No, no, that's that's a very evil thing to do. Okay, uh, I was thinking it might be. Yeah. Uh, so is that true? By the way, that like when you, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, never mind. So you, well, well yeah, I mean, you do sort of get, you do, you do get those. You, you can prove that those co limits exist or something like that, but they are not at all preserved by the interpretations. Okay, of the theories. Yes. You know, so it exists, but you can't talk. Because the morphisms, the interpretation of the theories are just like the, uh -huh. well, right. depending on what you're doing, either the left edge joints or the right edge joints, but they don't preserve the other thing. Um, okay. So that's a dangerous right. Okay, okay, okay. So, so what am I trying to say here? So, uh, I mean, there are these absolute co-limits co co that are secretly really limits. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Is there something like this that's going to work? What am I trying to say? Um, I mean, it's also now it's now it's getting very close to the point where, you know, you have sort of sh shown me that there's enough subtleties here that maybe I should go home and think about it for homework and try to get this to work. Um, yeah, and figure out, not just figure out how to get it to work, but figure out what context we might have a chance of getting it to work in. Um, right. Uh, oh, darn, I thought you'd, <laughs> I thought you'd, I'd hoped you'd cleverly figured it all out. It, I, I, I let me just think about it a little bit before I, before I give up on before I you know assign myself a homework assignment on it here. Um, so let's see. It, it, yeah, you're okay. You're making it sound like we have a group object, and that's very limited. But then my strategy for the rest of this really involves co-limits. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, How fatal is that? Let me think, let me think, let me think. Again, you know, it, it might be that maybe this will work out somehow in the Total two rig doctrine, um, but I'm, I'm not sure it works out there either. Um, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. And of course, for me personally, it's very interesting. Wondering, you know, what happens when I look in my notebook and, and find where I wrote this down and see, you know, <laughs> did I actually have something that made sense there, or was I completely fooling myself? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna um think about this for homework. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh I'm very unsure at the moment whether it's on the right track or not. Um, or whether I'm trying to do something that's impossible. I mean, yeah, well, anyway, it's a great question at first you might think like oh this empty torsor is not so bad but then if you think about like models in something like not that you normally do it like in sheaves or something if something could be yeah empty then there could be potential of all sorts of nasty sub of, of all sorts of locally empty things so i mean it's just yes. the tip yes. of the iceberg of a bunch of <laughs> yes 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 um yeah yeah so so uh i'm gonna go home and think about that 
but okay, so that means now we should try to get back to other things here. Um, so let's see, let's see. Um, all right, so, okay. So, okay, let me, let me go ahead here. Let me go to a new page here. Um, so, uh, well, so I've been talking about the art and reciprocity there, and I've been talking about this very torsor oriented approach to the art and reciprocity. And, um, And uh, and right. So I've got this idea that I've got this idea that if I'm, for example, let's say let's say I'm interested in Z mod three torsors. Mm -hmm. And an example of where I might be interested in Z mod three torsors, it might be, you know, over um, uh, well, over a commutative ring like Z, 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 Z for example. Um, or uh, again, I don't know how the terminology works. Maybe you say over the spectrum of the integers or something like that. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's the idea of, well, okay. And, and the Z mod three torsors, they're also, these, for example, are very closely related to uh, abelian cubic extensions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I just realized, right, I am doing this thing of Being very sloppy about things. Let, let me let me fix one of uh, one of the mis mistakes or very misleading things there. Let me say that, that I am working over the field Q here. Let's see. You mean you're working in the doctrine over that field? No. Oh. <laughs> uh that is, you're not what I meant by that was like you're not. So you're working in the doctrine of of total. I mean, you could you could think of it that way. I, I, you probably could think of it that way. Okay. So right. how were you thinking of it? That is, what doctrine are you using now, or does it, or should I relax? I, I, I was I, I was relativizing the doctrine over the. Um, O -o over the uh, abelian groups instead of over okay cool. some vector spaces or something like that okay but then but then I was you know talking about the, the torsors over uh the, the the spectrum of Q okay uh yeah that that makes sense that makes sense you know it'd be a model. Yeah, a model of the theory of a Z mod three torsor over this other, the spectrum of this other theory. Um, I mean, because of the way the yoga of relativization works out, it may in, in fact end up being the same thing as that you were saying of, you know, relativizing more thoroughly and having, you know, the whole doctrine being over Q or something like that. Um, but okay, so um, uh, 
so yeah, and, and I just wanted to use the field instead of the commuter ring, just because it's more clear what a field extension is, then I don't want to have to think about what a ring extension is. It might be related to all this issue about separable or something like that. But um, so, uh, I, you know, I've been focusing on this example a lot where I think about the the the, the group Z mod three and um, uh, You know, if we're trying to understand art and reciprocity, then probably we only have to worry about, you know, pro finite groups in general. And Z mod three is sort of like, you know, the, the, the general pro finite abelian group is not a lot worse than Z mod three. So that's why I feel like studying Z mod three is good enough in a lot of ways for me to learn what's going on. Uh -huh. um, so, um, so, We've been talking about this kind of thing, and um, and 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 the vague idea of you know the vague one of the vague intuitive ideas about the uh, art and reciprocity theorem is that it says that these kinds of things are classified by their congruence splitting or splitting congruence pa patterns. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um and right, but but right. So we also had things like uh, what am I trying to say that uh uh that that they're also classified by this idea of I mean we sometimes what am I trying to say? Um this idea that these are cube roots of Eisenstein or relative Eisenstein quantities, um, and and special ones that are like these, you know, fixed points, strong fixed points of Galois descent flavor, um, Galois descent with respect to the fact that the the group Z, Z mod three that it splits over the Eisenstein field. Um, so I mean, yeah, let, 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 right. Let's let's try to say what it is. So it's like something like uh, uh, it, it 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 corresponds to taking the cube root of X where X is in uh, GL1 of the Eisenstein field. Uh, and um, where the, 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 the strong fixed point property says that, what is it, that X squared is equal to the X bar. So, um, I mean, so this is part of what I've been talking about. This is this, this idea that, you know, that you can, you can classify these, um, abelian cubic extensions as in involving these, you know, taking these cube roots of these strong fixed points. Um, and and then and then and right. And then part of how the art and reciprocity theorem works, you know, right? I'm sort of saying that I'm classifying these torsors in two different ways, but then we want to understand, the relationship between those two different classifications and the relationship between those two different classifications is roughly supposed to speaking supposed to give us the art and reciprocity theorem and the um very roughly speaking that the, the 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 way the theorem uh works is that 
you know, the, the splitting congruence pattern has a modulus. And that modulus is very closely related to this thing that we're taking the, um, the cube root of. And, um, you know, so, so, so it's something like, for example, if you have the prime seven, uh, which factors over the Eisenstein field as something like, can I get it right? Is it one plus three times one to the one third? Am I doing this anywhere close to correct? I was... Uh. I, I have it backwards or something here. What? I always forget. So yeah, uh, I apparently don't care quite enough. So <laughs> <laughs> all right, let, let, I'm just going to stare at for a second, see if I think I did it right. Uh, okay. So it looks like one plus one third plus two then negative one one. Let's see. Wait, isn't this, isn't there something not quite working here? Let's see. Uh, I mean, what is this equal to? This is equal to one. Oh, okay. No, maybe it's okay. Plus, okay. So, okay. So this is, okay. This might be one minus three plus nine. <laughs> What's that equal to? One plus, yeah. That, okay. So I think this is actually correct. Um, that this is equal to one. Minus Three. Uh, so um yeah, this is this is supposed to be an illustration of, of how this this whole pattern works. I guess I'm saying that we can get an appropriate x here by having x equal to one plus three times one to the one third. Well, it's gonna be this it's gonna be the product of these same things, but one of them is gonna get an exponent. And this is somehow gonna work out. Um I, I guess I'll I'll put the exponent there, but I don't think it matters too much at this point which one gets the exponent. So The way it works is that when you take the cube root of this thing, and it's sort of a formal cube root because the the the, the for, you know the, the thing is an Eisenstein quantity, and the formal cube root is also an Eisenstein quantity. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas you know we're working over the rationals, so 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 you know we're 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 we're, we're treating these Eisenstein quantities as formal things with co you know coefficients, um, and um, but but the the, the the splitting congruence pattern for, you know, whether this formal cube root exists or not, or whether it, the equation splits or not, um, that splitting congruence pattern has a modulus, and that modulus is seven, if I did it right. So, um, so, okay, what I'm struggling to say here is that, uh, I'm 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 going to try to contemplate a sort of reversal of of focus here. So there there are two numbers that I've been sort of focusing on here. Um, one of them is, you know, and, and they're just right. They're just uh, 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 you know, the, it's this constant number three and this constant number seven. But I've really been sort of morally treating them as variables, right? I mean, just I've I've been working by examples, 
and you know three uh -huh. really could have been any prime and seven could have been any prime although it helps the, the fact that s seven is one mod three i guess but um uh so I want I want to think about what we're doing here, but I want to think about it with a sort of reversal of focus. So let me let me let me show you. Let me try to say what I mean by the reversal of focus here. So the way I set the problem originally, we had this classification problem to classify the Z mod three torsors over the rationals, for example. And the classification ended up involving in some funny way, this other prime seven that acts as a moduli, modulus for the splitting congruence pattern. Actually, it, it, I, I'm calling it a prime now, but it's in general, it doesn't have to be a prime, but the prime ones like give sort of the basic building blocks or something like that. So, um, uh, it's, it's not that important whether or not it's a prime or a co composite. Um, uh, for, for, so for now, and, and therefore, let's think of it as a prime because it will make it easier if we think of it as a prime. Um, and, and in fact, all you need is the primes in this particular mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm trying to say is what is um, instead of trying to classify all the Z mod three torsors. Let's let's try to classify all the ones. Let's let's try to classify all the Z mod anything torsors where the prime seven is going to be the 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 the, 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 the modulus for the split incongruence pattern. And probably this, you know, it's just some standard way, standard terminology of saying that I'm just doing some sort of local Galois theory or something like that. But I don't even want to figure out how that terminology works. So um, what I'm trying to say is uh, um, you know, originally it's like originally, right? Originally three is more constant than seven. But I'm just saying, let's think of seven as more constant than three. <laughs> uh -huh. And three. so, uh, so, so the question is, what are all the, um, what are all the um, primes three that will be uh, relevant here if we fix seven as the 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 the, the modulus that we're interested in mm -hmm. and so well so so you know so we so we we one of the reasons we chose seven was because three um because seven is 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 one mod three and 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 you know that's what encourages the 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 general linear group over seven over the finite field with seven elements, you know, to have its that general linear group to 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 to, to have its size divisible by three. Um, so mm -hmm. so um, so so so. So that's how I want to refocus the question. But uh, but I'd like to make it a little bit nicer than that. I'd like to refocus the question, but with a a little bit of a better story to make it to make the refocused question a more clearly interesting question. So 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 let me try to sort of restate this question. Let me, let me try to restate this question. Um, uh, and, and, you know, when I say restate it, 
morally restated. You know, I, I may I may be saying it, making it sound a little bit different, but that's okay because the way I just stated it was very vague and hard to follow. Now, hopefully, I'll be able to state it in a way that is clearer. So I'm going to a new page here. So I think what I'm trying to say, I think what I'm trying to say is, um, let's take the integers to join one seventh. And let's try to uh, understand all the torsors over this. All the torsors of finite abelian groups. Right. For the moment, let's just try to understand the torsors of finite abelian groups over this. Uh -huh. See, I mean, in some sense, what I'm asking for is some sort of abelianized fundamental group of the spectrum of this thing. But I'm a little bit at a loss to make that more precise because, you know, because I, I, I still don't understand the subtle or not so subtle differences between things like Etal and separable and things like that, um, but I but I think I understand what a torsor is over this, right? I mean, I, I just th think of it in terms of this doctrine given idea of what a torsor is. That you know, we we just have this, you know, the 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 the, the category of representations of some finite abelian group. Um, and, and we just, you know, mm -hmm. we, we think of that as a syntactic category of a theory, and we take the models of that theory, and those are the torsors. So the, the idea that you get a bunch of interesting G torsors uh, when there's a, when there are a bunch of, morally speaking, when there are a bunch of homomorphisms from the fundamental group of of the spectrum of this thing to that group G? Either that or exactly backwards. Can I think about it? <laughs> You're pretty sure you didn't get it backwards. Can I just think about it? Which can you say it again? Which, I don't you, know it, which back. I was saying that homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the spectrum of this thing yes. to G should Yes, Give that seems that seems yes, that seems the correct way. Uh, yes, I was afraid the arrow was backwards or something like that, but that seems right. the correct home, the direction for the homomorphism. Okay, um, so, so that you can, so that without knowing what the fundamental group actually is, you can probe its homomorphisms to all finite groups or maybe finite abelian groups right now by this method. Yeah. I mean, you could even somehow try to eventually use this method to define. It. Yes, yes, yes. And presumably all of that has presumably been done in some re pretty correct way. Um, but, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm, you know, not, I'm not trying to learn that textbook way at the moment. I'm, just, I'm still trying to, you know, uh -huh. fool around by myself trying to figure out how this works. Yeah. So, um, the one so, thing I don't yet at all get, by the way, is why you decided to invert seven. What's okay? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, and so that seven is the same seven that I was talking about on the previous page. <laughs> if that helps. But 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 let me help that much. So so but 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 let me also say a little bit what, what would happen if you ask you know why did I invert seven? Let's think a little. Well, on the other page. What happened if we didn't invert seven? What? What? You didn't seem to be inverting the seven on the other page. Maybe I, we were, and I didn't notice. So here it's, it came as a shock to me that you decided to invert. Well, it's, it, 
Let, but let me try to answer your question about why did I invert seven? Let me try to answer that sure. by thinking about what would happen if we didn't invert seven. <laughs> okay. So in other words, we would have Z and uh -huh. we'd be looking at, um, we would be looking at uh, tor uh, torsors over this, torsors of finite being groups over this. And, um, And that would have a different answer from uh, if we were doing it over Q. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, this is related to what I sometimes call voodoo mathematics, right? Which is, you know, the idea that the spectrum of a field is uh is is like something that's been subjected to extreme voodoo torture um yes i know this this tale yes all you know all the points have been removed you've stuck a needle in every point to remove that point and yet there is something left i also sometimes think of this as the cheshire thing it's like you know after you remove all the points there's still something left and, and uh -huh. it's it's the generic point of the field. But I actually, sometimes I picture this, you know, like, so the generic point of the field of rational functions, uh -huh. that's the thing that I picture as this, you know, extreme voodoo pin cushion. <laughs> uh, um, you know, so it's like a Riemann sphere, except everywhere, at every point, uh, it, uh, that point has been removed. So all you're left with is this spherical shape, but but no points. Um, but that that spherical shape is the generic point. Um, and um, <laughs> yes, I luckily I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> and um, right, and 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 in that rational function case, you know, it's actually a geometric picture that we can visualize. But now we're sort of trying to do it with these number fields where, you know, maybe so, so far, at least I don't, I'm not really able to visualize these, but we can tell similar stories. Yeah. Um, so in, in some sense, right, the only reason we, the only reason the rational field had all those torsors over it was because it, it we did it in, 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 you know, remove all those points by okay. inverting everything. Uh -huh. Um, so, right, I mean, I, th I think there's some famous theorem, maybe it's part of or corollary or something, corollary in some sense to the Kronecker-Weber theorem or something like that. And it says that there aren't any extensions of the rational field that, uh, there aren't, how does it work? <laughs> there aren't any Unra abelian unramified extensions. Extension. There are no <laughs> unramified abelian extensions or there are no un unramified extensions at all. Maybe that I don't remember about the non abelian extensions. Uh, I'll have to look it up. It's probably about a uh, yeah, back then they seem to be doing the abelian stuff, but yeah, I'll have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, well, but right, but maybe I'm misattributing it by saying that this is connected with the chronic Weber theorem or something like that. But, um, but certainly for the abelian extensions yep. of the rationals. Mm -hmm there are no unramified ones. In other words, if you don't have any needles inserted into the voodoo doll, then um, you don't get anything. You can't wrap your string around any yeah. needles, non-existent needles, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So so the rationals is, you know, this thing with okay. a lot now, now of I get what you, Now I get why you're inverting seven. So you just want to focus yeah. it. That's right. One hole. And so, you, so, so this should give, you know, this should think, give things that are just like ramified at seven or something like that. Um, um, and um, so is the fundamental group supposed to be like Z? Probably not, but that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, right. We should, we should think about that and try to see what we can come up with here. Um, but, um, okay. 
Well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, I mean, right, it, it, this is supposed to make things more manageable. Yeah. Yeah, I get it now. More manageable yes. compared to Q. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But on the other hand, maybe this is too manageable. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, um, Let's manage it before you say <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I just, I just, I just want to anticipate a little bit, you know, that if we get to the point where this seems too manageable, then, you know, we could do things like, you know, invert seven and then also invert 11 or 17 or something like that. You know, uh -huh. just invert a few primes. And, you know, so that would correspond to, right, a spectrum, which was probably, you know, simply connected or at least abelian simply connected or something like that. Um, uh, but just with, a, you know, a very few holes poked in it. And, and, and I just want to say that this reminds me of all sorts of things. So it reminds me of, right, I mean, It reminds me of taking like the Riemann sphere and just poking a few holes in it. So you get a multi-punctured Riemann sphere. And for and there are all sorts of different interesting possibilities. I mean, for example, the three, if you just put three punctures in the Riemann sphere, then you haven't introduced any moduli <laughs> yet, right? Because uh, you know, you don't get any the moduli space doesn't actually have any continuous dimensions until you get the cross ratio when you add the fourth point. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. but re regardless, it's right, it's it's still interesting to look at the the three, you know, three punctures or four punctures or five punctures. And somehow this has a lot to do with, I don't know, it reminds me of all sorts of sort of stuff about braids and Groton D Teichmuller theory and stuff like that. But here it's, you know, instead of involving the Riemann sphere, it's involving, you know, these more difficult to visualize arithmetic spectrums, which, you know, so apparently, the, you know, apparently the, the spectrum of the integers is in some sense simply connected or a billion simply connected. Uh, and, um, you know, you have to start putting holes in it by in inverting some primes. Um, and 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 then this reminds me of you know all sorts of these analogies between number fields and allegedly three manifolds or something like that, uh, where uh, you know I, I don't understand this yet, but we've talked about it. The idea how about you know the quadratic reciprocity is or the what is it called the. The Jacobi symbol, that's the symbol that's the, the, that, that shows up in quadratic reciprocity or something like that, and how that's supposed to be analogous to something. I thought that was the Legendre symbol. Say it again? I thought that was the Legendre okay, symbol. Okay, Legendre symbol. Okay, okay. I guess Jacobi symbol is some, yeah, higher degree or something generally. Uh -huh. okay. well, Legendre symbol, yes. And the Legendre symbol is, there's supposed to be some analogy that we've tried to learn a little bit about at various points. About how that is, uh, that is, uh, like a linking number or something like that. Yep. Uh, is that is that is that the right n n n terminology? Something like a linking number or something. Yep. Like that? Yep. That's right. Yeah. Ka Kaprana and, is right about that. Yep. So. That vaguely reminds me of, you know, what would happen if we tried inverting seven, but then also inverting three or 17 or something like that. I, I don't see how it fits all together yet, but, mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, I'm throwing out some random vague intuitive ideas here because it seems like they should all fit together somehow, but that doesn't mean I have a, a sensible idea of how to fit them together. So, but we're talking about like, right here, we're talking about removing points. Well, points from these funny arithmetic spectrums, but we're making analogies to, I was making analogies to what happens when you remove a point from like, you know, the Riemann sphere 
or some, remove some points from the Riemann sphere. And, but, but some of these other analogies that we've been hinting at, those that talk about things like, instead of removing a point from the Riemann sphere, you remove a one dimensional thing from a three manifold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you've got, and, and it's like, you know, it's, you know, like a knot complement or a link complement or something like that. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, that's very interesting, suggestive, but I'm going to it also confuses the hell out of me because, you know, three dimensional things are odd dimensional and they're not, you know, I'd be more tempted to take something like take a complex two dimensional thing and remove a, uh, a one-dimensional complex thing from it. And that, you know, right? That seems like it should be related in some way to this three-manifold stuff where you... Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's more of this mystical yoga that people are very <clears throat> interested in these days. And I'm very people interested... Actually, in... People actually do talk about that? I, I, I wasn't sure that they... Sorry, what, the three-manifold stuff? No, the complex two manifold. Stuff. Oh, complex two. With you know, with with complex one manifold, like with you know, so right. So I'm picturing I'm picturing something like a complex two manifold, but with some, for example, with some elliptic curves removed from it. So it's like, Right, those elliptic curves could be knotted inside the complex two manifold, knotted in some sense. Um, and I'm curious about how would that would relate to these other anal anal uh, analogies that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So, so, so. Yeah, so, so, right. So one of the things I'm wondering about is what is the, what are the torses over, over, over this like? And also, is there some way to, what happens if I try to connect this to the, you know, stuff you've been talking about separability? So like, what are like the separable, Algebras, separable commuter algebras of this commuter ring. Um, are there any interesting ones? And uh, are they, you know, like, is, 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 is there any connection between those separable commuter algebras and these torsors that I'm trying to talk about? Are, are, are they like sort of talking about the same kind of thing? And, you know, if so, how is this stuff? Of, or, you know, I mean, I would have thought I was probably talking about something etal or something like that. But but when I think about it, you know, in terms of these torsors, I, I, you know, I'm just thinking in terms of interpretations of these theories of the group representations is mapping by this, you know, associated, associated vector bundle functor, and it's giving me a torsor. And I don't even think about separability or talness or anything like that but yeah I, I i bet that like a, a tallness is relevant in that when you start talking about i mean because i will be getting a boolean topos out of this if, if i do this the right way i will get some sort of a mm -hmm. boolean topos out of this so i was saying that like i think yeah, go ahead. my vague impression is that yeah, what you're doing. Ultimately, it's very connected to the Atal world. Um, and then this fundamental theorem of growth and Galois theory, that's for extensions of fields. And, and it's phrased, at least I've seen it phrased. In that's just your extensions of fields. Yeah, the well, sorry. They're, they're, I'm sure there's a version that's uh, more right. Different. 
the right. version, okay. yeah. the version, the version that mentions uh, commutative separable algebras is for fields. And so my vague impression, which could be completely wrong, is that the tallness is more more of a subtle thing, more stringent than 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 this commutative separable thing, but that they coincide for field extensions. Okay, so, okay, it could be something like that. It, it, that's it, just it, my it, current it could, hypo hypothesis. Okay, it could easily be that you actually said that explicitly last time, and I just didn't listen carefully enough. So um, well, I wasn't mainly talking about its Hall stuff last time because I don't know. Right, understand. right, right. Well, but I asked it about it a little bit. Yeah, uh -huh. um, yeah. So um, uh, I'm just taking my notes here. I, I think this might be a good time for you to start talking, but let me. Uh, we still have time, sort of, right? Yeah, we still sort of have time. Let me just check my notes here. Um, I mean, I realize this was very disorganized today, but uh, that's okay <laughs> from my point of view. And I, I, I really have to work on that homework assignment that I now have about trying to understand this thing about torsors and non-emptiness and orbit spaces. Let's see. Um, okay, but I'm just like I said my notes here. Well, uh, I need to, th so, so you made it sound like separable, th at one point you made it sound like separable things are, I forget whether this was, you know, exactly the same thing as separable or just related in some way, but, but it was some, something about the idea of a map having no, to say vertical tangent vectors or something like that, meaning that all vertical tangent vectors are trivial or something like that. Was that yes. that was a consequence or an equivalent? That's an equivalent concept for let me see if I say this right. Okay. Certainly for I, I'm forgetting now, but certainly for fields, it's an equivalent concept. Okay. 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 And I, I might, and it, and I have a ah. Now you might make me want to look stuff up. I think that might even be true for like more general algebras. There's also a question of how you interpret that quantifier of saying that all vertical tangent vectors are trivial. Uh, you know, you, you could say all global ones are trivial, or all you know, even locally, all tangent vectors are trivial, or something like that. I don't know. So yeah, I mean, I mean, question globally. precise. Yeah. Yes. I mean, this one statement, here's like a precise statement. Yeah. If you've got an algebraic extension of a field. Yeah. Then the, the extension is separable if and only if the derivations of the big field relative to the smaller field, meaning that vanish on the, on the smaller okay. field. So they're really all there really is involves so, fields, and, and we're, so we're talking about global derivations. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, you can talk about in more general context. You can talk about local derivations, or maybe even in this context, you might be able to talk about some kind of local derivation. Something like that. But okay, 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 that helped. Maybe I'll just stop there for now. And um, uh, do you want to interrupt the recording while you or you're, you're ready to talk now? Uh, let me pause it, and then I'll. Well, well, okay. First of all, first of all, let me just uh, save this whiteboard, okay? Yeah. So how do I do that? I should be able to figure it out. Let me give me a second. I think I should be able to pause the recording while you're doing this operation. Okay, but I think I think. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm just not very good. I'm. I still have this problem with. Okay. Okay, so all this stuff about separable algebras is really on my mind a lot. Okay. And I'm really interested in learning more about it. And there's this great paper by Aurelio Carboni. Yes. About this stuff from a very category theoretic point of view. That's one of the papers I'm studying. But then yes. as a kind of sideshow, yes, maybe I've been trying to understand semi-simple algebras. Yes. Um, 
it seemed to be in some ways like an earlier historical layer of under studying the same kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, so, I mean, one way to say it is that like an, one thing you can say, I believe, is that an algebra over a field is separable if and only if when you extend to any, uh, maybe any algebraic extension, or maybe any extension of that field, uh, the algebra remains semi-simple. Okay, say that once again. I'm just kind of struggling here with my uh, notebook here. Uh, that maybe I should say it again. Yeah, maybe I should write. Should I write stuff? I was. Uh, gonna I wouldn't mind stuff. that. I wouldn't mind that at all. I was, yeah, I was going to write stuff at some point, so maybe I should already start. Uh, so. Something, something like. Um, something like this. I'm not 100% sure this is exactly right, but an extension. Okay. Um, I don't know how you want to put it, like a little field contained in a big field is separable. Wait, that's not what I meant to say. Sorry, that's not, <laughs> sorry, that's not what I wanted to say. Well, I'll write this one to, or two, but this is not okay, what I meant okay. to say at all. So this, this is, this is, sorry, now my, now my poor computer is starting to fry. It's bringing out with this very heavy duty Zoom software. Right, um, yeah, so we might have to, I'm going to try to reduce its its cognitive load here a little bit. Yes. Um, hope that helps. Um, so, sorry, I got this. I started writing a statement that was the uh, thing that had just been on my mind instead of the thing I was supposed to be writing, but maybe I'll just go ahead and and do it something like an extension K is separable if, shit, uh, I have to practice writing more to get back into the swing. If, if um, like the derivations of K that like, vanish on guys in K. So I don't know, you can think of this as like derivations of the big field as algebras over the little field. So I make up some notation for that is trivial. Um, and I'm forgetting right now if, if that's for algebraic extensions or arbitrary extensions. So that's one kind of thing that we were just talking about, but that's not what I was trying to talk about. So what I was trying to say, was some other thing, which is that, and so like an algebra A over a little field K is separable. So this is a different concept of separable, but closely, closely related. Uh, yes. If so, there are millions of characterizations of it, but one of the one I was trying to mention is that so, like, you can take your algebra and you can extend it to become an algebra over some larger field. Um, so and we want this to be semi simple. Um, for all, and again, I'm forgetting if it's for all algebraic extensions or all actually all extensions for all. So, so uh, 
yeah anyway i i think it's like all algebraic extensions uh of k of the little field to some bigger field so it's sort of some kind of stable semi simplicity robust semi simplicity um Uh, and then I happen to remember that it's like, or you don't need to look at all extensions, and I probably mean just all the algebraic extensions, but you can just look at the algebraic closure. Uh -huh. And just do it like, like that. So I don't understand these things terribly. Well, actually, uh, yeah. um, that is, there are lots of characterizations of separability of algebras, a lot of equivalent definitions of it. And then there's also this concept of separability of, of fields that has many equivalent characterizations. And then they, for algebraic extensions of fields, the the concept of separability for the as a field extension coincides with separability as an algebra. Uh, uh huh. So there's this network of ways of thinking about these things, and I'm trying to explore it. And I don't know why. Yes. For some reason or other, I've started out talking about these two things, which are like among the things that I understand less well than than others. Uh, but but I. I want to. So I mean, you know, like why do what, for example, like what is this no derivations condition have to do with this semi-simplicity that like, you know, that 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 I don't understand. It's probably it's like they're like probably like two different ends of some bunch of equivalent conditions that have to be related by some intermediate ones. But anyway. So all of this is a lame warm up to what I actually wanted to talk about, which I started trying to understand semi simple algebras. I was trying to actually understand them before I realized that separable algebras were so important. Um, yes. And so for so there's this famous old theorem called Wedderburn's theorem. I always say Wedderburn, and I finally learned that it's it's a Wedderburn. Where did Wedderburn hang out? He was born in Scotland, and he got his, and it's a Scottish name. Burn yes, means yeah. creek. Yeah. Uh, and he got his degree in University of Edinburgh, uh, but he did also spend time in Germany. And then he went to, went to Princeton. And he did huh? it in Princeton in his later years, learning a bit about him. So, okay, but his original theorem goes like this. Um, so suppose A is a semi-simple algebra over a field. I gotta give my field a name, the usual name. Okay. So then he yeah. said what it has to look like. So this algebra has to be a, a finite product. I should define what semi-simple means just in case. In, well, you may know perfectly well, but uh, maybe I should define it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so it's a finite product of matrix algebras, let's say D by D matrix algebras over of with entries in some division algebras. Yes. So these were these DI are division algebras over our field. Yes. So Um, I've been trying to understand this theorem. I think I understand it pretty well right now. Um, 
Um, so the, well, okay. Uh, what is, let's see. Well, first I'll go right away to the, to the art and so art and later on generalized generalize this. Yeah. And so there's a, I'll be nasty and just erase things. So there's a better, it's very similar theorem. So he proved a better burn art in the theorem. Okay. And there are different ways to say it, but the easiest way to say it is that you, you don't work over a field. So you don't work with algebras over a field, you just work with rings. Um, so you just say a semi-simple ring. And then this exact same thing is true, except instead of saying division algebras over a field, you say division rings. Yes. And this version, I now understand, instantly implies the previous version. <clears throat> yeah. Because um, <clears throat> I guess, yeah, well, you, you can, a semi-simple algebra over, <laughs> sorry, an algebra over a field is a division algebra, if and only if it's a division ring. And an algebra over a field is a semi-simple algebra over the field, if and only if it's semi-simple as a ring. So, okay. so there's like, no, there's no extra yes. stuff to, well, anyway, that, that does most of the work of, of it. So, so, so this Wedderburn Arden theorem, it's also no harder to prove than the original Wedderburn theorem. The way I've stated it, it's no harder to prove. So might as well just switch over to that. Um, and so there are different concepts of what it means for a semi ring to be semi-simple. Sorry, I mean, there are different definitions of the same concept. Yes. Equivalent of um, yes. Do you have some favorite ones? Uh, the definition of a semi-simple ring? Uh-huh. Uh, well, is there is there going to be something about def defining it in terms of semi-simple modules or something? Yes, definitely. I mean, that sounds like it might be a good way to do it. So one nice way to do it is that you say that the category of modules let's see I'm sorry I'm just noticing some annoying thing one way to do it it's is sort of like it's sort of like a two vector space or something like that but with you know different base yeah so one one way to say it Well, okay. One, so one way to say it uses the concept of a semi-simple category. Yes. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm like realizing that I'm confused about the definition of that. So basically, there's just like one, there's one little nuance here. So um, to worry about. So like a semi-simple category. is one where every object is a is a co-product sorry uh sorry let's uh, i know you may not like this and maybe it's bad but yeah i'm gonna do it anyway so i'm gonna say it's an abelian category okay that's a pretty standard way to do it. So you don't probably need to mention limits. You can probably just mention color. But for every object, there's a co-product of simple objects. 
Okay. And, and what's a simple object? It's an object without with only trivial quotients, meaning only the only quotients are itself and the zero objects a with with only yes zero and a as quotients. That's a a. a a nice, this concept, so this way I'm stating it, I'm like trying to use only uh, co-limits in everything that I talk about, co-products and quotients. But yeah. but if you're in an abelian category, then that's the same thing as saying, uh, uh, objects with only trivial sub-objects. And and that's sort of the ability to flip back and forth between the uh, those two points of view is useful is or is maybe necessary in proving the the uh, Artin Vetter, Vetterburn Artin theorem. Um, so one thing that's one thing that I'm find myself confused about right now is when I say co-product here, do I mean a finite co-product or do I allow infinite co-products? And yeah, I'm not too much worried about that, but I can see why you might feel forced to worry about it. Yeah, there's some point at which that matters a lot. So like if I only allow finite coproducts, then this next definition would would not fly. So <laughs> so so there's this next definition is that like a ring. Oh, I already said it. Okay. Well, no, I didn't, I don't know if I said it. I didn't say it. A ring is semi-simple. A ring R not necessarily commutative, is a semi-simple if the category of modules is semi-simple. So it's always gonna have modules that are like infinite co-product, infinite sure. Uh, sure. co of itself, for example. <laughs> or of yeah, I mean, yeah. So my version, my, my preferred, version of a semi-simple uh, category in, in involves allowing the infinite sums. Um, you know, there might be other versions where you don't allow the infinite sums or something like that. Yeah, the, the interesting you know, the thing I have right? to understand, yeah, uh, I'll definitely have to think about this because it affects yeah. the argument. There's, it affects the art and it affects yeah, yeah, it, yeah, there, there are certainly things, reasons to worry, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, right. So let's see, at this point I could do two different things. I could, I could show you the proof of the Better burn Artin theorem, which is like really pretty damn easy. Um, or I could show you my generalization of the Better burn Artin theorem, which is sort of like a centipede mathematics approach uh -huh. of, of trying to extract out the, some of the key and the key ingredients to what makes this theorem work, and thus generalize it that way without without any extremely great motivation for why I'm doing the generalization, although I think it probably could be useful, but uh, 
So I don't know. What would you prefer me to do? Would you prefer? <laughs> I, I could do both, but uh, well, was, I'm, well, first of all, I'm just trying to guess where your what direction your generalization is heading. Yeah. So the kind of when we see, yeah. So like maybe I should show you the proof because it's so. But okay. When you look at the proof, you see, for example, that we use almost nothing about rings. Yes. What we use so much more is this is this category R mod yes. being semi-simple. Yes. So that we can sort of focus our attention on the category more than on the ring itself, it turns yes. out. And then the second thing is that although this concept of semi-simple category uh as customarily defined requires that it be a abelian either up front or as a consequence yeah um it turns out that we very use very little ab about abelianness and we don't there's a way to deal with things so that you don't uh get the um you, you don't need subtraction. It, you don't need an ab abelian group enriched category to get the to get this stuff to work. So, uh -huh. so I wound up basically proving a Vetterburn Arden theorem for categories with certain properties that are that are weaker than of being a semi-simple category, but include the semi-simple categories. Uh huh. So that was sort of the direction I wound up going. Uh -huh. uh, so I guess it's a, so what, I don't know, maybe you don't want to answer this, but I'll ask you anyway. So which would you prefer to see the, the they're both pretty short. The proofs, of, what would you prefer to see? The original Art and Vetterburn or the? Well, I have a feeling that even if you show me the proof of the original that, I mean, you're claiming that it's really easy to understand. I'll, I'll, I'll probably have to think the proof. Of, I mean, you know, maybe you could do the proof so sketchily that you'll you have time for the generalization as well. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, I can do that. So, okay, so here's so here's here's the proof of the original one. So, so say R is semi-simple. So that means that the category of modules of R is semi-simple. And so that means that R as an R module is a co-product of simple objects. Um, I'm going to write, well, for some stupid technical reasons, it's sort of nice to use right R modules, <laughs> just for the same reason you use right torsors. Yes. Uh, so this means, uh, sorry, this means R with it acting on itself on the right. Okay. So, so I guess R could also stand for right, but that's not what it stands for here. So, right. um, so, so this thing is a, is a co-product of, of simple objects. And what I notice, though, <laughs> is that in proving the Art and Vetterburn theorem, you at this point, you you say for whatever reason, you, you say that it's a finite co-product of simple objects. The I think the whole the Art and Vetterburn theorem would not work as stated otherwise. So for some, for whatever reason, we need to, we need to assume this. Um, so, so there's a glitch that you, that explaining this to you has helped me discover. So there are different ways to deal with a glitch, right? So one way to deal is, yeah. it is you say like, don't use R mod, use finitely generated R mod. Sure. And the Cree that, that every object in there is a finite co-product of simple objects. Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, <laughs> whatever. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll straighten that out sometime. But okay, so we we they definitely assume this. I mean, for some reason or other, this is the definition of a simple. This this follows from what people call a semi-simple ring. Um, I'll have to think about some ones that are <laughs> bigger than that, and like what what good what's funny about those. Yes. Okay. So so let's so let's write it out like that. So so it's going to be this. It's going to be the sum. I'll write it like a sum here, of a bunch of different simple objects, which I'll call like x sub i. Like say there are n different ones. But but let me let me take these simple objects to be actually non-isomorphic to each other, different from truly different from each other. So then each one may show up with a multiplicity. Each one could show up a bunch of times. So let's say, so let's say that these, let's chop it up into these, into these pieces where these XIs are, they're simple and then and they're not they're not isomorphic to each other. Okay. Yeah. This proof is super short. Uh -huh. So now what we do is we look at the we look at the endomorphisms of of r as a right r module so i'll calculate end of this thing yes so so when you do that there right looking at endomorphisms of an object that's a that's a actually a byproduct this coproduct is a byproduct looking at endomorphisms of an object that's a byproduct of a bunch of pieces uh, just involves looking at a kind of matrix. Yes. Yeah. And, and then there are no morphisms between, except zero, between yes. non-isomorphic simple objects. Yes, yes, so the, yes. So, so there's no crosstalk between different right. simple objects. But then when you have a simple object with some multiplicity, Showing up in your here, then then the endomorphisms of that. This is like xi summed with itself some number of times. Then the endomorphisms of that thing will give us a, a matrix, a square matrix, a di dimension on di by di matrix of yes. endomorphisms of that simple object. Yes, yes. So, so we just calculate it out that way, which required that these coproducts were byproducts, by the way. Yes, yes. Um, for, for when we Try to figure out how to generalize the hell out of this thing. So this endomorphism ring of our ring as a right module of itself will just be a, I guess I should write it. Maybe if for some reason I feel like writing it as a product because I guess it's a product in the category of, of rings product from one to n of these matrix algebras that are matrix algebras where the entries in the matrix in the ith matrix algebra is just endomorphisms of that ith simple piece of our ring. Okay, and, and so, so we're done for me to check here, but I think I'm getting the idea of how this works. But go ahead, yeah. And so we're basically done because the point is that the point is then is just uh, is that well, we're not quite done, I guess. Is the point is then this maybe you know this already, but the point is that these endomorphism rings of the simple objects they're division rings, 
Right, right, right. We have been talking about that recently, yes. Yeah. Right. Since I mean, <laughs> again, not, I, we've been talking about it, not necessarily with proof, but not necessarily with clear proof, but it's, it should be a very straightforward proof. Yeah, I've, I went through the proof of that. I'll mention something, which is that when you prove that, what you do is you like look at an endomorphism of your simple object. And you want to show that it's either zero or invertible. That's what division ring means. And so what you do is you look at the kernel of that morphism and the co-kernel of that morphism. Um, and, and so the kernel is some sub-object of your simple object and the co-kernel is some quotient object. And both of those have to either be zero or the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, from that you see, we wind up seeing that either this endomorphism is zero or the only other case is that both the, the kernel and the co-kernel are, are trivial and then it's an isomorphism. So, so F is zero or an isomorphism. Um, so that's where we, that's the one place we use, well, <laughs> we're either using the definition of abelian category or we're, yes, we, <laughs> Or we're we're using this aspect of the definition of simple. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's yeah. So that's just it. That's all there is to it. Yes. Um, and oh, sorry, I just have one really stupid. Sure. Yeah. 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 Comment. Question to to it. Um, just in the back of my mind, I should be talking about this stuff. I've been wondering whether you know there's a terminology that I've heard called Artinian. Mm -hmm. um, is that in any way related to? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. yeah. Yo, well, now, you don't even have to tell me how it's related. I pat myself okay. on the back for having like managed to avoid that, but I could explain it. Yeah, because Arden did use Artinian-ness in one uh, restatement of one version of this Vetterburn Arden theorem, and I did not need it. But I'll tell you. <laughs> well, you don't have to. You, you could. I, that's well, but go I, ahead. Yes, go ahead. Well, I only only if you care. This is sort of like a. This is sort of like. You'll be just thankful to me that I like I didn't. But I'll I'll just tell it to you. So okay. there's a concept of a simple ring. Yes. Which is that it has no two sided ideals. Right. And then there's this irritating fact that a semi-simple ring doesn't need to be simple. <laughs> because, saying, okay, because of the opposite or something? Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, well, because it, so, well, there's, in, there's interest in this, yeah. So, so, well, like one thing is that like when I talked about- So, I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> semi simpleness is a handed property? Well, that's another, that's a relevant question now. So it turns out that like it's superficially, it is a handed property because I defined it using right. Yeah. But it turns out you can show that it, that a ring is left semi-simple if and only if it's right semi-simple. Okay. So that, so that okay. isn't actually the problem. Okay. But one aspect of the problem is that both those concepts, they're about left ideals and right ideals. Yeah. And they don't instantly, whereas simple is about two-sided ideals. Yeah. So there's some yeah. work to be done. And, and so it, it turns out that uh, it's just not true that every simple 
ring is semi-simple. Uh, for example, the one that you know and love is the uh, vial algebra. Yes. So that's simple. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, it's, there are interesting reasons why it's simple. Go ahead, yeah. But it's not, but you can tell that it's not semi-simple if you believe the vetter bernhardtian theorem because it's not a bunch of, it's not a matrix, it's not a product of matrix. Well, it's not a matrix algebra over a division, right? And so, so, so what, so what Arden came up with was a condition. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm sure he did a lot more, but what he uh -huh. <laughs> came up with was a condition for simple rings to be semi-simple. Uh-huh. And that one way to say it is that if it's simple and it's Artinian, then it's semi-simple. Okay. So that's the way sometimes people drag Artinianness into this story. If we were working with algebras over a field, we could say if it's simple and it's finite dimensional, then it's uh, semi-simple. And so the vial algebra not being finite dimensional is sort of what, from that point of view, if you think of it as an algebra over a field, the fact that it's not finite dimensional is what makes it break out of the better burn theorem. Because it's simple. There's a lot of interesting questions there, but uh, oh, okay, that's yeah. good now. Yeah. 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 So, anyway, yeah. So, this could like go on, but this is sort of, but basically, this is the kind of stuff I was wanting to, figuring out how to sidestep. Um, and it's sort yeah, of no yeah. how to sidestep it, which is that you just focus on semi simple stuff. Yeah. Which you define more category theoretically and, and avoid this idea of a ring being simple. So, yeah. so then, yeah, so if you march in that direction, you can continue marching in that direction. That is the category theoretic direction. Yeah. And you get, you can get this kind of deal here. So, so here's like a, a generalized generalized Vetterburn Arden theorem. So, so I'll pick a category, call it A for some random reason, uh, which, um, but well, it's a category that has a zero object and byproducts, which I guess people, which by which I mean binary byproducts. And I guess that's what people always mean when they say byproducts. So, so this kind of category I just learned recently was is called semi-additive. Okay. You may have thought about this kind of situation. It's a nice. Yeah, something like that. So in this, I mean, just for the listeners, the zero object is both initial and terminal. And then, yes. then that lets you define byproducts. It'll, and it, when you have a zero object around, you, you always get a morphism from any co-product of two objects to the product of the two objects. And then if that's an isomorphism, we call that thing, a, either one of them, we call it a byproduct. Um, so I mean, you get something that's enriched over commutative monoids instead of over abelian groups. Right, yeah. So the, so the nice thing is that it automatically gets to be enriched over commutative monoids. Yeah, matrix formalism still works. Right, so a bunch of stuff still works. Um, and then I'm just going to, Put a bunch of <laughs> not a bunch, but I'll put a hypothesis in here. So 
I'm going to look at an object in in A, and I want this object to be semi-simple. And now I'm making up some new concept of semi-simple, new concept of semi-simple object that's, so I probably shouldn't call it semi-simple because it's already used for so many millions of things, uh -huh. but, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, so, so what I'm gonna mean by that, this is like meant to be a very stripped down definition or in some sense. So it's a, it's a byproduct of finitely many uh, simple objects. And I'm going to have to define that too. <laughs> uh, with with but more than just that, because I maybe because I haven't proved enough theorems yet. Uh, and I want it to be that these objects don't talk to each other at all. So that is the 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 set of morph the morphisms from one of those objects to another is just the zero morphism. Yes. Um and I'm, when I say that it's a byproduct of a bunch of simple objects that are have only zero morphisms between each other, I'm a, that's a slightly confusing way of saying what I mean, which is that I'm going to allow any one of those simple objects to show up a bunch of times in the byproduct. So say that again. What? I'm so I will allow any one of these summands xi to show up some bunch of times in, in x. Sorry, I'm, I'm just getting a little bit confused about this idea of simple objects that don't talk to each other. Can uh -huh. you give an example of simple objects that do talk to each other? <laughs> no, I, no, I don't, because I have to define what I mean by simple. Uh, and in this high level of generality, it isn't instantly obvious to me that they might not talk to each other. So in an abelian category, simple objects that are not isomorphic don't talk to each other. Okay. Uh, in an abelian category, you can show that two simple objects are either isomorphic or, or they don't talk to each other because you, you look at a morphism from one to the other and you look at its kernel and its co-kernel. And if both of those vanish, then the objects are isomorphic. Otherwise, the morphism is zero yeah, because okay. okay and then that doesn't okay yeah yeah so um so here i'm trying to steer clear of that type of argument involving kernels and co-kernels because i'm trying to yes. like strip it down to the bare minimum yeah so i'm going to give some other definition of simple object uh and that doesn't rely on abelianness and and I'm, so i'm okay. going to stick in assumptions that uh, in the old framework would just be consequences. Okay. Uh, and I haven't fully explored the example, so I don't even, sure, sure. I don't know what I'm doing yet. Sure. Except I'm just trying to get a theorem that's true. Sure. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, so it's sort of half-baked mathematics. In a way. Okay. But, um, but, the, but the point I was trying to make right now is that <clears throat> when I say an object is semi-simple, I'm saying it's a byproduct of finitely many simple objects, which I need to define what that means, that don't talk to each other. But but I wanted to emphasize that each one of those simple objects can show up with multiplicity. So sure. Yeah. Okay. So well, for the people who like formulas, which I know is not you, I will just write like my X is the sum of these simple objects, but then they show up with some multiplicities, these numbers I was talking about before called DI. So, yeah, so that's the deal. And so what's a simple object um, for me? Uh, so, huh, so I got an object, say, 
y is simple if every endomorphism of it is just either zero or an isomorphism. <laughs> Yes. So that's equivalent to the usual definition of simple when you have an abelian category. Yes. It turns out. Um, but this is easier. But this is something that I can state uh, in the, using just this uh, doctrine of, <laughs> of, yes. of, of semi-additive categories. Yes. So, so um, that's what I'm going to do. And so what I haven't investigated at all yet is it like can you have two simple non-isomorphic simple objects that still talk to each other in the sense that they're non-trivial homes between them uh -huh. uh, and i didn't instantly see how to prove they don't talk to each other so i wouldn't be sh completely shocked if at this right. same generality they could talk to each other uh, right um okay so so that's what we're, that's the hypotheses of this theorem the hypotheses is longer than the proof probably so uh so so we've got a semi-additive category and a semi-simple object in it and so then the then the thing which is completely trivial but but so what um is that the endomorphisms so the endomorphisms of an object in a semi-additive category will form a a rig as you noted yes uh because these categories are enriched over commutative monoids yes so we get this rig and then this rig we can work out what the endomorphisms are just like we did in the before yes. <laughs> using the fact that our object is a byproduct of a bunch of of things so so and we are asserting that these there are no interesting morphisms between these different xi's so we'll just get a our endomorphism rig will be a product of matrix rigs where there are matrices with endom of endomorphisms of these simple pieces which just by decree i didn't reveal it yet but you probably already noticed that when a, uh, an object being simple in this new sense is exactly the same as saying that the endomorphisms of that object form a division rig <laughs> a rig uh -huh. where every non-zero thing has an inverse uh -huh. so the proof of the theorem is just instant and it's just sort of like the Copy from it's what it, 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 it I mean you kind of copy the proof right yeah it's just no. copying the proof of the hypothesis concrete adapted case. yeah so the so the interesting thing about one well one tiny little mildly interesting thing about so like yeah. from this from this abstract version yeah how do you get the how do you get back the original version so so this abstract version is talking about the endomorphisms of an of a semi-simple object whereas the so-called concrete version was about the the ring oh i actually didn't finish the proof of the of, so, so okay. in the original version I, I i didn't finish the proof and that's what i'm talking about now actually so yeah. So like I got to the point of saying like, oh, the endomorphisms of your ring as a module over itself is this product of matrix algebras. But the last last little step is the, yes. that the ring itself is isomorphic to that endomorphisms of it as a right module of itself. I think of that as like the ring theory version of Cayley's theorem. Yes. Yes. Theory. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So that's the last. That's the last step. Um, that that's, and so that's what you need to use to get the uh, the so-called concrete theorem from the yes theorem. And one thing I've been I want to do that I haven't done is 
<clears throat> maybe put some, maybe generalize that last step to a greater, to a larger context. So like, there'll be some kind of situations where, where when you figured out the endomorphisms of an object, and the object is a monoid object, then you can, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> well, ah. Ah. I'm, I'm just saying that I'd like to generalize all that stuff to, to here. Yes. So there's some kind of context where you, you have a monoid, you could think about the category of actions of that monoid. Yes. And then the monoid op becomes an object in there because it acts on itself by like left multiplications. And then there's some kind of such abstract nonsense that says that like sometimes you can figure out the original monoid from it as a action of itself. Yes. Um, so anyway, that's some kind of some kind of Yoneda theorem, -y kind of something or other, Tanaka crying Yoneda e stuff. Yeah. Anyway, but anyway, I haven't done that yet. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll have to think about that. Okay. But anyway, this is yeah. So I, for some reason or other, for many years I thought that the Vetterburn theorem was a little bit hard I think there's some proofs of it that are more confusing or something uh -huh. <laughs> but right. now I mean, it really yeah it, 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 the way you're describing it makes it sound very straightforward yeah so good <laughs> right it's so straightforward that I instantly want to make it more complicated <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. right but uh anyway so that's that okay so there's tons of things to wonder about it, but that's that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll pause. Maybe I'll pause the video here and we plot our next move here. Okay. Uh, sorry, pause the recording. I right. paused the video just then. <laughs> you know what I'm doing. Where, where? Are we paused yet? No. 